Central West Farming Systems operate a, re a, a, a regional trial site network. Ningan is about as far north as we go. We go as far west as Merriwagga, far south, west as sort of Rankin Springs, and then basically we follow the Newell Highway. We're west of the Newell Highway. Um, so we've got this site here. We've got a site at Wee Valley. We've got a site up at Alec Town. So across that region, in the last two years, we've run 18 trials that look at how late imposed stubble treatments affect crop performance. Traditionally our sites, at a site like this, we would have, we've run five varieties of wheat and five varieties of barley and planted in little plot in the traditional white peg plot trials. Um, this trial site here uh, experienced a bit of spray drift early in the site so it's been, it was just re-sown commercially when the, when Gus Maslin, uh, Sadie's commercial crop around the outside, we just got him to spray, uh, to sow across the top of it. And so what we're, what we're seeing is not the plot trials, but we're looking at how commercially sown wheat is impacted by these different stubble treatments. There's four replications in it, so we can get good statistics out of it. And in the, just by way of uh, an aside, in the paddock next door, the canola paddock next door, we've got a similar trial in canola. And that trial has been also used by CSIRO researchers and they're looking at the impact of different stubble treatments on beneficial and pest insect populations in the paddock. So there's a lot of data coming out of these trials. So we should have already seen, if, if we've run 18 in the last two years, we should have started to see a few trends. And one of those trends that we're, we're seeing at the moment particularly where we have established five varieties of wheat and five varieties of barley, the first and most important one is that stubble treatment will not improve a varietal performance in relation to another one. So it won't make a, a poor variety better than, than, the, than the, best, the best similar variety. So the, the take home message is regardless of what you do with your stubble treatments, so the correct variety in the correct sowing window to get maximum yield, right? You can't make a crap variety better by ploughing late or burning late or... Do, there's been no interaction with disease that we've identified out in yield. We haven't really looked through the grain or analysed the grain quality that we've been getting off each plot. But just looking at the data, there doesn't seem to be any interaction there either. So first thing to remember is issues like fallow management and sowing on time are still major yield drivers in this area. And let's not overlook that and try and mask that by, oh, well, let's, you know, do something different with our stubble. Get your crop in on time, have a good summer fallow, and you're a long way to getting a good yield. I'm glad John Kierkegaard's here. I'm going to put the acid on him a little bit. There is, there is some work that John and James Hunt have been doing out of some long-term trial sites that shows that there's a bit of an interaction between growing season rainfall, stubble load and yield. Can you explain that in a couple yeah, of minutes, John? I've had a trial running at Harden for 25 years with stubble burn, stubble retain and cultivate or no cultivate. And, and so it's been in wheat every second year. So the long-term results of that show that basically it's in the wetter seasons, you know, wetter than average seasons where stubble retaining stubble versus not uh, starts to cause yield issues and you can imagine that could be tying up nitrogen, uh, disease related things which tend to be a bit worse in wetter years, leaf disease at this time of the year I mean, and um, uh, or frost, frost and just frost and wet and cold conditions. So um, it's not a huge effect I think over those 25 years with around hard and an average wheat yield of 5 tonnes per hectare, it's about a 0.3 tonne per hectare loss. Um, on average, but it's very big, it's up to a tonne in the wet years, and in the dry years you don't really see it at all. In the dry years it's mostly water that's driving things. But I would say, as John said, stubble's done most of its work for you in the fallow by protecting the soil surface so that you capture every bit of rain and store it there. The question is, after sowing, does this stubble in amongst this crop, is it doing you, know, is it doing you any further benefit there, and do those benefits outweigh the, 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 um, you know, the, the problems? Um, some of the problems we can control with, you know, row spacing and keeping the stubble away from the crop with disease. We've got some fungicides now. Um, there's a lot you can manage. So if you, 
if you're not going back to a pasture, uh, if you're not a mixed farmer and you're not putting a paddock into pasture, then stubble's pretty much the only way you've got to maintain soil carbon levels. And, and, and you won't maintain them with stubble, you'll, you'll slow down the rate of decline. So the only really way to build soil carbon is to have a pasture phase or, or something like that. But retaining stubble is, was certainly slow down the decline in soil carbon. So, um, I mean, most guys want to keep it there um, if you can. And that's what this project, this national project is all about. So CSIRO, as John said, is trying to look at what's new in this area. And I think one of the new issues is what insect pests are we starting to develop, particularly in canola. And so Serena's here with this group doing that. I'm on my way down to tomorrow now. What we're doing is trying to find out where the nitrogen goes in all this stubble because we're told we shouldn't burn because we're losing all the nutrients and that's true. And yet it seems to be we need to put on a bit more nitrogen to get the best out of stubble retained systems. So that's not making sense. Um, and so what we want to know is where is all the nutrient, where is all the nitrogen going that's in all that residue there? If it, if, is it getting back into the soil and how long is that taking? So. Um, so that's the other issue and of course weed management, uh, managing herbicide resistant weeds in stubble retained systems, you know, how do we, how do we handle that? So that's, that's um, right. all I want to say, John. Yeah, right, John, thanks for that background. Um, now I did present a paper at the Parks Update a couple of weeks ago, the GRDC update, and in that paper, and it followed on from one that James Hunt presented last year at West Wyalong, we're coming up with a with a rough number, and it's still to be really tested, but a rough number of, if you've got more than three tonnes of stubble at sowing on the ground, and your growing season rainfall is about 250 millimetres in crop rainfall, you're potentially losing some yield. They're sort of pretty, pretty rough numbers and really need to be tested further, and that's part of this program. But that's where the numbers from our trials are sort of sitting and the long-term data coming out of uh, John's work. So just here, at, at this site here, our median in-crop rainfall is about 220 millimetres. So it doesn't take much to get to the 250 millimetre. If we go north or east from here, our, rain, our in-crop rainfall quickly gets to the 250 millimetre mark. We go west to here, Condo's about 200. So a good year at Condo, you'll get the 250 mark. Right? If we go south of here, by the time you get to Quandiala, which is not that far as the crow flies, we're 250 millimetres. So it sort of sits, we're right on the edge of whether it's gonna cost us yield or not in where we're standing. Right? So it's, it's worth making some decisions. Now one question I'd like to ask the group, how many people here actively measure their stubble load at sowing? Does anybody know what a three tonne stubble load looks like? No? Righto. Three tonnes of stubble, quite literally, if you take a metre a meter quad, and I did have one and left it over there on the fence, but a metre square, chuck it on the ground, rake up all the stubble there, <coughs> if you get 300 grams of dry stubble, that's three tonnes a hectare. Right? So, and, and if you get 100 grams, you've got 100, no, you've got one tonne, you get 200 grams, you've got two tonne, 400 grams, you've got four tonnes. So it's a you know, metre square, do it a few times. Look, and if we're going to learn anything out of this project, and it was in that, it was in the last sheep presentation, if you don't measure it, you can't manage it. So it'd be nothing better than in a few years time when we say how many people measured their stubble, like 80% of the, the old 80-20 rule applies and 80% of people put their hand up and say, we knew how much stubble we had at sowing, right? So if we're looking at it here, if we're looking at an average year, with bigger than three tonne stubble loads, we might be suffering a yield penalty. There, that's a bold statement on some rough numbers, but that's what the project to date is showing us. So then how do we manage that stubble to gain that yield, but not cost us much money, is the profitability and retain in the, in the project. Uh, there's seven, you've got seven opportunities to manage stubble from harvest to sowing. You can do it at the header, you can take the old do nothing option which is probably the status quo at the moment. You can cultivate it, you can burn it, you can bale it, you can lay it over or you can graze it. I can't think of any others. I open to suggestions but they're basically <laughs> your seven. 
All of them have advantages and disadvantages to your farming system. For example, if you've got a farming, if you're in a weed situation that is very heavily reliant on post on pre-emergent herbicides because of herbicide resistance to in-crop sprays, then cultivating it is perhaps one of the worst things you can do because you redistribute the seeds right throughout the profile. And your, your pre-emergent herbicides will become less effective. Right? If you're looking at maintaining maximum amount of carbon in the system and keeping, and carbon's important for nitrogen mineralisation. I'm not worried too much about its impact on climate change. I'm worried about its impact on nitrogen in the system. Right? Anybody wants to follow that through, get onto the papers from John Angus that Di talked about in the presentation yesterday that show the role of carbon in, in these systems in, in maintaining our nitrogen levels. Right, if we burn it, we leave the ground exposed. Um, and then particularly if you're growing a crop that produces little stubble coming forward like a canola crop or a pea crop or something like that, you then got another fallow where you've got your ground fairly well exposed. Causes problems. But having said that, they've all got their advantages. If, for example, you're going to apply lime to your, lime to your paddocks and you want to renovate some wheel tracks, cultivation's probably a really good option and get rid of the stubble while you're going, right? If you, if you come into, um, it's back. Yeah. Do you want to wave? Yeah, we should wave to Beetle. He's the man that sprayed our crop out. We won't talk about him. But he is supplying the rum and the beer for the cutout party. No, the rum and the wood. Oh, that's an aside. If we if we're where was I? If we yeah, so there is an advantage in cultivation in certain paddings. Renovation of wheel, wheel tracks, your tram tracks, uh, getting lime incorporated into the soil. <coughs> Burning Look, if you get to a situation where you can't sow because of the stubble load and your gear's broken down and it's all going to go bad and you're not going to sow on time, burn it. Don't, you know, get, get it out of the system because what will drive your profit is sowing on time. One thing we have looked at uh, managing stubble loads with uh, the header at harvest, unless there is an agronomic reason to do so, and the only one that I can think of is if we want to get into windrow burning for harvest weed seed management. Unless we want to do that, it's a really expensive option to manage stubble loads at harvest, cutting them short, trying to chop them up and throw them back over the paddock. Because there's a big black cloud coming over there and we're going to get wet grain. Just get your crop off, fellas. Right? Um, if you Google it, there's some YouTube clips on blokes recutting their crops and preparing their stubble. Bill Long out of South Australia has got some YouTube clips on that. Yeah, look, really do the numbers on that. You're running a big expensive machine over it and you're producing a pretty paddock, but yeah, I don't know, I don't know. But anyway, so that what we're looking at in these trials is the impact of burning, standing stubble or cultivation. We've run 18, what have they told us? Right up, of the 18 trials we've run, uh, 10 have been, I think it's 10, have been run with stubble loads under three tonne. And they have received in-crop rainfall of less than 250 millimetres. There has been no significant difference in yield across any of the wheat, barley or canola varieties in those trials for what the impact of sowing, uh, the impact of stubble treatments. So that number holds fast. There was two sites where there was, sorry, there was two sites where there was but they were sites on red brown earth with no ground cover during the fallow and they were really tightly compacted sites and they responded to cultivation. If anybody can remember Neville Gould from Camphor, he had a saying, no till with no stubbles, no good. And he was dead right. On grounds that packed down hard and they've packed hard due to either uh, overgrazing or windmill grass infestation or something like that, <coughs> cultivation is the answer. And it's, and there's no easy way around that, that's just what it is. But generally speaking, in normal paddocks, no response. In the paddocks where they've had bigger than three tonne stubble loads, we've had significant response, statistically significant responses to yield in wheat and barley in either the burnt or the cultivated treatments at six sites. So 60% of them have yielded, out yielded um, just the standing stubble treatments. 
That's to both treatments. Two sites responded only to burning and two sites responded only to cultivation. We haven't been able to unravel the mystery. One of them actually ne responded negatively to cultivation. So we haven't actually been able to unravel the mystery so as you can predict what your yield response will be. We're still working on that one. But it does reinforce that idea. Heavy stubble loads, bigger than three ton. If you're likely to receive more than 200 millimetres of rain, in crop rainfall, perhaps think about managing your stubble. There is a small yield advantage if you can do it cost effectively. But you will quickly lose it if you don't manage your stubble, uh, your fallows correctly and you don't sow on time. Anybody that wants to graze fallows, we've had a, oh well it's four years, don't know whether that makes five years now, grazing stubbles trial at Condo Ag Station. The data coming out of that says that grazing sheep on fallows, so long as we maintain about a two tonne stubble load and 70% ground cover, Grazing sheep on stubbles doesn't appear to impact on the subsequent crop. You've got to manage your sheep well on it. You've still got to control your summer weeds, but it's not impacting on crop performance going forward. And the take home message, the one that the sheep bloke should remember is that sheep don't do their damage from that trial. Sheep are not doing the damage with their feet, they're doing the damage with their mouths by removing ground cover. All right, so I don't know how many people here actually graze stubbles, but that's what's coming out of that trial work. So, if we just look at this trial here, on my left, that one there was the burnt treatment. This was sown about, uh, I did have the date on the top of my head, um, mid-May. It's Spitfire wheat. Um, it's uh, now under a normal commercial program. Angus Maslin really pushes his crop so it gets everything chucked at it. Um, and he expects it to perform fairly well. So the burnt's on my left, uh, cultivation on my right and a standing on the next one down. And what we see here is fairly typical of all our trials, everyone wants the burnt plot because it just looks really good at this time of the year. Right? Later on in the year, if, if it had been a really good yellow leaf spot year, no one would want the standing stubble one because you start to see yellow leaf spot in. By harvest, it's sort of all average out colours, unless we've had a really wet year. So, um, again, manage the stubble, get the benefits of any agronomic benefits you can, pick up along the way if you've got to uh, manage it and try and get it out of the paddock. And by getting it out of the paddock, it's just simply getting it to decompose quicker. So, knocking it over, you know, uh, bailing it, whatever. There is a paper, everybody's got a there's a paper available with advantages and disadvantages of those seven methods. I'm happy to talk through the issues individually later. But I think that probably covers off on this trial. And like I said, anybody that's interested in seeing this and other trials, we've also got trials at Weath Alley, Mumble Tank, which is 70 k's west of Condo, for anybody that really wants to have a really good look around the, the cropping systems of the, of, uh, the low rainfall group. But it's, it's worth the trip for that one. There'll be field days coming up at that one. And there's another one at Tottenham, where we've got the individual different varieties performing, performing there. So, um, yeah, happy to take questions from the group or later on. Yeah.